Section 1 of A Flurry in Diamonds. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Pym. A Flurry in Diamonds by Amos Chiptree. Chapter 1. I am junior partner in the house of Hopkins and Company, manufacturing jewelers, Maiden Lane. The senior of the firm is my father, Mr. John Hopkins, who established the business many years ago in a small way in a suburban town noted for its manufactures in this line. As the business grew larger, like most of his competitors, he opened a city office and sales room in room in the lane, in which, after leaving school at eighteen, with a preference for a mercantile rather than a college or professional career, I was promptly installed, first as a general clerk and later as assistant manager. My father still retained chief control both at the factory and store, in each of which he passed a part of every day. Three years ago, after having passed a sort of apprenticeship at the store for four years, I was duly announced as a partner in the house and assumed more responsibility in management, relieving my father in his advancing years, of most of his cares, so that nowadays he takes the world easier than has been his custom. He still retains the larger interest in his concern, however, and gives the business all of the attention required of him. We do a large business in a general line of the finest grades of goods, especially in mounting diamonds and other precious stones, of which we always keep on hand a valuable stock, both mounted and unset, as the advertisements run. Though the business is not what it once was in the way of profit, and competition has somewhat slackened the hold which the old house formerly had on the trade, yet our name and reputation go for something, and we manage to realize pretty comfortable incomes from it. As our business, more than any other perhaps, has to do with the soft side of human nature, and our wares appeal directly to the vanity of people, as well as to the depth of their purses, we have many opportunities for studying the different characteristics of our patrons, and the result is sometimes quite entertaining as well as profitable. As an instance of this, our house once sold in flush times a rare gem of immense size for $30,000, currency of the day, to a celebrated pugilist, upon whose expansive shirt front it became the envy of every would-be sport in town. It could be worn with perfect safety by its owner, on account of his influence over such people, but, in the possession of a respectable person, it would have been, like Wilkie Collins' moonstone, a dangerous gem to its holder. Necessarily, such purchasers are rare, but not more so than stones of such value. Though strict moralists may condemn the wearing of expensive jewelry, the fact remains that the majority of mankind, and womankind too, have an appetite for it which must be humored, and as it is our business to cater for them, we undertake to do it in a satisfactory manner at the old stand. But all this is shoppy, and not the point of my story, which, with your permission, I propose to tell in my own way. It is the record of a queer jumble of circumstances, and if it interests you nearly as much in the reading of it as it did me while participating in the events to which it relates, I shall be amply repaid for the trouble I have taken and propose to take before we part company. Chapter 2 One day early in May of the present year, Mr. James Lindley, the father of my most intimate friend, Pierre Lindley, called at the store, as he had often a way of doing when downtown, and, as he was about leaving after a pleasant chat, mentioned the fact that his daughter's nineteenth birthday would occur in a day or two, and, as he had always remembered both his children and gifts on these anniversaries, he desired to purchase something appropriate, but was quite at a loss just what to select. He had sounded her a little on the subject, and her preference seemed to be for a pair of solitaire earrings, although she was quite modest about it and did not insist upon them. The old gentleman said he thought she had a fair supply of jewelry left by her mother, but perhaps it was old-fashioned, and, come to think of it, he believed that, although there were a pair or two of earrings in the collection, he did not remember that there were any set with diamonds. For his part, he did not believe in them any more than he did in ornamenting the nose after the manner of the Indians. But still, he supposed he was an old fogey, and, if Kate would get any comfort from owning them, why, perhaps she might as well have them. At his request, I showed him a fine assortment, 
and knowing him to be rich was careful not to select any low-priced goods i could get no idea from him about how much he would invest in the jewels nor did he know any more than did i how miss kate's taste might run as to size or style of the ornaments he was in quite a quandary out of which with one eye to business and the other eye to pleasing miss kate i assisted him by suggesting that i should select a number of sets of various patterns and values drop in at his house during the evening and let miss kate make her own selection subject to his approval the idea struck him favorably and cautioning me in a joking way not to bring any of extravagant value and get up a conspiracy with kate to ruin him he departed satisfied to be so easily relieved of his anxiety on the question of the gift i selected a dozen pairs of the latest designs we had all mounted with perfect first water stones none of them very large but ranging in value from four hundred dollars to a thousand dollars of the pair i removed them from their cases and hooked each pair into a small piece of cardboard with the weight of stones and value of the set plainly marked thereon each pair also bore the little tag containing our private mark in number which we always keep attached to goods of this class the cards being separately wrapped in thin paper the whole were then placed loosely in a small pasteboard box which i could easily slip into the inner pocket of my coat their combined value was just seven thousand eight hundred dollars selling price and a beautiful brilliant lot of sparklers they were chapter three i had known the lindley family ever since my school days when my friendship with pierre had commenced this intimacy had continued with slight interruptions up to the present time the longest period of our separation having occurred during pierre's four years at college the intimacy being resumed again when he returned to the city to prosecute his law studies and later became settled in practice with a mr blakely his father's friend and attorney and a distinguished member of the bar i was a frequent visitor to the house after passing the nights there with pierre i had seen kate grow up from a child and noted the indications of her increasing beauty of face and figure with the interest of a brother having no sister of my own and being thrown so much into the company of this very interesting young sister of pierre's i had come naturally i think to regard her in much the same way that he did with no thought of that regard developing into anything either sentimental or romantic for mr lindley senior always had a strong attachment which i believe was reciprocated on his part towards me at all events i was heartily welcomed at his house and he encouraged in every way the intimacy between pierre and myself on the evening in question after a light dinner at my club i strolled around to the house which was situated a little off from the present centre of fashionable residences although when mr lindley built it some twenty years ago before the neighborhood began to be encroached upon by the advancing demands of business it was quite a swell location the house a large double one faced with brown stone was not unlike many of its kind so distinctive of the house architecture of new york before the inroads of the queen anne elizabethan colonial and other ornate and varied styles so prevalent today in houses of the better class but while so plain of exterior appearance it was a roomy cheerful house within and in its expensive finishings and rich but homelike furnishings demonstrated the ample means of its owner combined with the excellent taste of his daughter who having lost her mother in childhood assumed at an early age the control of domestic affairs for which she had a natural liking and ability my ring was answered by jerry a smart-looking colored lad who acted as butler waiter and generally useful man about the house learning from him that miss kate was in the reception room i went directly there with my usual lack of formality fairly rushing up to meet me with an abandon which i thought under the circumstances was excusable and a welcoming handshake which was assuring she did not wait for me to be seated before she began i am awfully glad to see you fred as i always am you know but papa says you have a pleasant surprise in store for me and i have been on the anxious seat of expecting so long ever since he told me at dinner in fact that i am getting worked up to high tension as it must be fully a quarter of an hour since you were warned of your anticipated pleasure it is only a wonder to me that you have managed to survive at all until my arrival so not to assume any responsibility for your symptoms taking on a worse turn if you will seat yourself at that table and allow me to do the same i will at once relieve your anxiety and myself of the innocent cause of your trouble 
so saying i drew a chair up for her and another for myself on opposite sides of a little ebony table previously removing therefrom a small statuette which it held as soon as we were seated i drew the box from my pocket and placed the contents upon the table in the careless manner usual to us in the business as i have said they were a pretty lot even by daylight at the store among so many others but as they were displayed under the brilliant gaslight on the dark background of the table cover their merits were more fully developed drawing back with a little shriek of delight kate did not appear to comprehend the purport of the display although she suspected i think that it was in some way connected with her approaching birthday i explained matters to her and as she seemed quite modestly indisposed to make a selection alone i suggested that she should call in her father and pierre for conference as i declined to recommend any choice to her this plan meeting with her approval she rang for jerry and on his appearance sent him to summon them they soon came in and kate meeting her father with a kiss said so this is the pleasant surprise you told me of isn't he a dear good papa pierre to be so thoughtful of me and to think that he should have decided upon the very thing i most desire this as if she were entirely innocent of ever having given a hint upon the subject i arose as they approached in order to make room for them about the table and as kate led them up they all remained standing for a few moments in a general survey of the diamonds they formed a very interesting group to me this little family whose pleasant home life always ran so smoothly surrounded as it was by all that wealth liberally scattered could provide for their comfort and enjoyment mr Lindley had commenced life a poor boy early apprenticed to a mechanical trade for which he had great aptness after reaching his majority he had rapidly advanced first to be a foreman then superintendent and later on a partner in the large manufacturing establishment which he had entered a dozen years before with apparently no better prospects of success than other boys of similar age and circumstances with whom he was associated he had soon attracted the attention of his employers by his marked ingenuity and inventive genius and was scarcely out of his time before he began reaping the benefit of important original inventions in the way of time and labor-saving machinery he had retired from active business several years since with a snug fortune and besides was still in receipt of an almost princely income from royalties paid him for the use of his valuable patents i see him now as he stands there with his son and daughter interested in surveying the sparkling jewels upon the table nearly six feet in height with broad square shoulders and erect figure good development of bone and muscle without much spare flesh he looks the very impersonation of health and vigorous middle age his thick dark brown hair and close trimmed beard and moustache show only here and there signs of advancing age and a sprinkling of gray rather full-faced with a florid complexion high broad forehead and large brown eyes with a pleasant amiable expression of features and easy courtly manner he is every inch a gentleman self-made and self-taught his children have inherited more or less of his qualities of person and character in his daughter this is noted in the rather high color of her complexion the massive coils of rich brown hair and so far as the expression goes in her eyes which however are darker fuller and of a sparkling brightness rare to find she is scarcely above the medium height of well-developed figure graceful in movement unconventional and charmingly familiar in her ways pierre resembles his father in many ways tall and compactly built dark-haired and dark-eyed handsome features with a cheerful sunny look about them he shows to those who come often in his way that he has been well schooled in what pertains to perfect manliness no less in a practical than in an intellectual sense they were soon seated and engaged in examining the jewels all of them even to the old gentleman disclosing that sort of infatuation which a collection of fine diamonds properly mounted and in a good light appears to have for people not in the trade expressing their preferences rather hurriedly only to change their opinions again and again finally the decisions of all seem to lie upon either one of two pairs priced respectively at five hundred and fifty dollars and six hundred and fifty dollars the larger stones being passed over both on account of their greater cost and a suspicion expressed by pierre that they might be a little loud for so modest and quiet a person as kate ahem finally mr lindley suggested as kate is the one to be tortured by wearing them let her decide the matter for herself 
by trying them in her ears and posing before the mirror there, as only women know how to do, she can get the proper effect. Kate, complying smilingly, arose and, adjusting them one after the other, carefully scanning the effect of each in the glass, was not long in deciding upon those which I thought would be her choice. This was the pair marked at $650, and as her selection was approved by all save myself, who had no voice in the matter, excepting to vouch for their rare quality and novelty of design, I considered the matter as settled, and that I had made a good sale. As I had an engagement later in the evening, and did not wish to be encumbered with the box of jewels, I requested Kate to retain them all until the next day, when I would call or send for those to be returned. Besides, I said, you can thus have an opportunity of a further comparison of them by daylight, and be able to more satisfactorily determine your choice. This arrangement seeming most agreeable, after cautioning Kate in a joking manner to be careful and put them out of the reach of burglars, as I should hold her responsible for them, I departed to keep my appointment, for which I was already a little late. End of section one. Section two of A Flurry in Diamonds by Amos Chiptree. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter four. Next morning, upon reaching the store, I found my father already in the office. He had come in early to arrange some private business of his own before starting upon a little tour of pleasure, accompanied by my mother, and which he said would occupy ten days or so. They were to leave that afternoon by one of the sound steamers, and mother was to meet him at the office in time for the boat. I have neglected to state that father had always kept his residence in the town in which our factory was situated, where also I had made it my home, coming and going to and from the city daily, until, as my responsibilities had increased at the store, and to save time, as well as having a liking for city life, during the past two years I had occupied a suite of rooms at a fashionable uptown hotel. It was not the most agreeable way in the world of living, but, as a number of my acquaintances, business and social, managed to subsist in the same manner, and, as, consequently, I did not lack for company, and besides, often managed to turn a little business among the former during the evenings, I did not object to it, for a while at least. Part of my meals I took at the restaurant in the house, and a greater part of them at my club in the near vicinity, besides often dining with the Lindleys, and, as I have said, passing the nights there. I frequently passed the Sundays at home with my folks, and often ran over there between times, thus retaining a very pleasant domestic and social connection in my native town so that altogether I did not have much time to pine in my bachelor quarters. To return to the story. Shortly after my arrival at the store, I was called out on a business errand down the street, and, on my return a few minutes later, I found Jerry, the servant up at the Lindley's, awaiting me. He hastily handed me a note addressed to me in Mr. Lindley's hand, which, upon tearing open, I found to run as follows. Tuesday morning. Fred. Your diamonds have been stolen in a very mysterious manner while we were at breakfast. Come up at once if you can. If you think proper, you may confer with the police on your way, but would advise that you do so in a way to avoid publicity. Yours hastily, James Lindley. Concealing my excitement as much as possible, I first dismissed Jerry with instructions to hurry home and report that I would be up right away, and then telling father that I was called out upon very urgent business, and requesting him to look after matters in my absence, I left, promising to return in time to see him and mother before they left on their journey. I decided to go at once to detective headquarters, and secure the services of an officer there in whose shrewdness I had great confidence. He had been employed by us in business of a similar character, connected with the robbery of one of our traveling salesmen, which resulted in his cleverly capturing the thieves and recovering most of the stolen goods. He was not at the office when I arrived there, and, quite impatient and not a little excited, I was about leaving without divulging my business when he came strolling in. Quietly stepping up to him and saluting him, in as few words as possible I stated the nature of my business, and requested him to accompany me at once, to which, after a moment's interview with his chief, he agreed, and, calling a carriage, we were soon on our way. This man, Sloan by name, was no different in appearance from the hundreds of men whom one daily meets about town. He was a fair-looking man of perhaps fifty years, of average size and weight, dressed in an ordinary business suit of gray checks, 
clean linen, well-brushed shoes, and the conventional round top hat of the day. He looked neither more nor less like an ordinary businessman or a smart clerk. His manners were easy, and his whole appearance rather pleasing than otherwise. His reputation in his calling was high, both at headquarters and among the business community, with whom he had extensive and varied experiences in his line. As I had no further information to impart on the subject in hand than was contained in the few lines from Mr. Lindley, our conversation on the way uptown was general, and I found Mr. Sloan to be a fair talker, but a better listener, which, perhaps, was more in his way. We soon arrived at the house and were met at the door by Mr. Lindley, who, upon my introducing Mr. Sloan, at once invited us into the library for consultation. The old gentleman was somewhat agitated, and seemed relieved and pleased at our arrival. As soon as we were seated, with rather a forced smile upon his face, he said, Well, Fred, our efforts to celebrate Kate's birthday appear to have had a rather serious climax, don't they? Well, yes, sir, I replied. Judging from your note, I should say it looks that way. But, as I know nothing of the particulars, just how serious it may prove, I cannot, of course, surmise. As time is valuable in such cases to your friend here, Mr. Sloan, I believe you called him. I will at once repeat to you all the facts of the case so far as I know them. After you left last night, Kate took all the diamonds and placed them in the safe upstairs. This morning, before breakfast, she took them out and into her room for a further comparison by daylight, as suggested by you, and her former choice being confirmed, she placed the pair selected in her ears for the purpose, as she expressed it, of stunning Pierre and myself at breakfast. Just then Jerry came and told her that breakfast was ready, and, as you know, Fred, that Kate must always look things over in the dining room before either the family or guests are summoned, she ran downstairs, leaving your diamonds carelessly exposed upon her dressing table. As breakfast was announced, on my way down, in passing the door of Kate's room and casually looking in, I saw the girl Winnie standing in front of the glass with one of the rings in her ear and apparently admiring the effect. Stepping into the room, I went toward her, when she, hearing me approach, pulled it out and threw it down among the rest. As she turned, she met my reproving glance in an embarrassed manner and hastily left the room, neither of us having spoken. With no thought that Winnie would steal the jewels, but with an idea of scaring Kate and reproving her for tempting the cupidity of the servants, I gathered the jewelry together in the box and, going through to my own room, placed it in a drawer of my dressing case and, locking the same, placed the key in my pocket, and went downstairs. Pierre following shortly after, we were soon seated at the table. During the meal, Pierre chaffed Kate considerably over her poor taste in wearing diamonds in the morning. In answer to his good-natured taunts, she explained her reason for doing so, that she wore them especially to please him and me, and more the same view. I put on an innocent face, and asked her if, before coming down, she had replaced the balance of the diamonds in the safe. Upon her replying in the negative, and acknowledging that she had left them exposed in her room, assuming a very serious manner, I read her quite a lecture on her oversight in thus tempting the servants of the house, to say nothing of the great risk of our becoming the victims of prowling thieves, of whom we hear so much nowadays. Pierre joined me in what he evidently considered merely a little innocent tantalizing of his sister, as, of course, he was ignorant of the scare I had prepared for Kate as a further warning to her. We succeeded in getting her into quite a worriment over the affair, after Pierre had hurried off downtown, which he did as soon as breakfast was over, Kate left me at the table, saying she would go up and put away the jewelry, thus easing my mind, although she had not thought of any danger, and thought that I was more than usually apprehensive of it. Chuckling to myself, I followed after her, and had just reached the door to the library here, when I heard Kate coming down the stairs, and, turning to meet her, saw that she was greatly agitated over her discovery. She beckoned me in here in a most excited manner, and scarcely able to talk at all, she told me that the diamonds were gone, box and all. I tried to appear horror-stricken at her words, while I had to labor to keep from laughing at the success of my ruse. I repeated my scolding over her carelessness, said I told you so, and otherwise treated her rather cruelly for a few moments. When I thought that she had been sufficiently punished for what, after all, was a perfectly natural, if not quite excusable, offense, I tried to pacify her excitement, which kept increasing. I finally told her of what I had witnessed on my way downstairs, 
of my having put the jewels in a safe place, and now that she was through with her lesson, I would go up and get them for her to put in the safe until they were called for. Inwardly pleased at the success of my little scheme, I went up to my room followed by Kate, unlocked the drawer, and drew it out, when, to my dismay, I perceived that the diamonds were missing. Search the drawer as I would, not a sign of them could I discover. I tried the other drawers, hoping, as a person will in such a case, that I had mistaken the proper one. I looked into all kinds of impossible places and receptacles, but they were gone, and, up to this time, no clue of them has been found, and it looks now, Fred, as though you had made sale of the whole lot instead of a single pair of them, as, of course, I am responsible to you for their value. Well, Mr. Lindley, we are not discussing that side of the case just now, though, if it will relieve you to know it, I may state that there is considerable doubt in my mind about your having any responsibility at all in the matter. But what we want to know is where the diamonds have gone, and it would please Mr. Sloan, I imagine, to know also something pointing toward the person who took them. While we have only a selfish interest in the value of the jewels, Sloan, you know, has, in addition to a slight interest therein, as indicated by the amount of his reward if they are found, also a professional interest looking to the capture of the thief. Is that about it, Sloan? There is some truth, Mr. Hopkins, in what you say, and, as time is of great importance in these matters, the quicker we commence looking into it, the better show we shall have to make any headway in what looks just now like a somewhat mysterious case. And Sloan put on a serious face as he quietly arose from his chair. Suppose we go upstairs and look over your rooms a little, Mr. Lindley, said Sloan. Mr. Lindley, acquiescing, led the way, and we all went up, nothing being said by either of us, until we reached Mr. Lindley's apartments. These rooms were at the back of the house, while Kate's apartments, upon the same side of the hall, were at the front. They each comprised a large sleeping room with boudoir attached, the two sets communicating by a door between the dressing rooms. This door just now was open, as Mr. Lindley had left it when he passed through to secrete the jewels. End of section 2 Section 3 of A Flurry in Diamonds by Amos Chiptree. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter 5 Sloan took in the whole situation in his quiet, professional way. I carefully searched for any trace which should lead up toward solving the mystery, and kept an eye on Sloan. I had about concluded that we should find no clue there to encourage us when Sloan began questioning Mr. Lindley. Are you sure, sir, that you locked the drawer after placing the box of jewelry in it? Quite sure, and that I placed the key in my pocket, both acts being quite unusual on my part. And you found the drawer locked on your return? Yes, sir, and remember distinctly taking the key from my pocket and unlocking it. After a moment's thought, Sloan stepped up and taking the key from an adjoining drawer and substituting it for the one which Mr. Linney had left in the rifle drawer, vainly attempted to insert it in the lock. It would not work at all, and, after satisfying self of this fact, he replaced it in the lock from which he had removed it. It seemed to me that Sloan went through this performance more for the purpose of killing time while he was studying the case than with an idea of getting any clue from this source. For, supposing the key to have fitted the lock, it would be ridiculous, I thought, to further suppose that the thief had used this key, and, after securing the booty, had so carefully relocked the drawer and replaced the key. Still, I had great confidence in Sloan, and knew that discoveries which might seem to outsiders as most trivial and without bearing, to men in his line were often of great value, and led to most important results. Sloan next proceeded to a most careful examination of the lock and its surroundings. Turning the key back and forth, listening to the throw of the bolt, looked into the keyhole and at the outside woodwork about it, but failed to make any discoveries, as was evinced by his remarking to Mr. Lindley that he could find no evidence of the lock having been tampered with. It had probably been simply picked with a wire or opened with a false key. The latter was the most likely, as the culprit would not have been apt to linger after securing the diamonds long enough to relock the drawer with a wire, which would necessarily take some time. By what fancy, or for what purpose the drawer should have been relocked at all, he did not see, 
but the circumstance was quite unusual and he also thought of slight consequence as he turned from the bureau, noticing that the lower sash of a window alongside of it was raised, he remarked in a casual manner to Mr. Lindley, I suppose this window is just as you left it on going out before the robbery? Mr. Lindley seemed quite taken aback at the question, and hastily answered, glancing at the window, No, sir. I never open that window myself, even on the warmest nights, there being plenty of means of ventilating the rooms without it. As it is in a direct line with my bed, and as i am a little inclined to rheumatic twinges at times i am careful about draughts especially at night besides as you will perceive there is directly beneath that window the roof of a porch over the back door of the house which renders the window easily accessible to thieves hence i always keep it closed and locked no sir although i have not thought of it before in fact in my excitement have not noticed that it was open I can assure you that it has been raised by someone since I left the room on my way to breakfast. As I gave orders, upon discovering the robbery, that nothing should be changed here, it follows that the window was opened while I was at the table. Mr. Sloan's growing interest was apparent, as he said, I suppose in airing the rooms after you leave them in the morning, this window, like the others, is usually opened for a while? Whose duty is it to attend to that? well i have never given any instructions to anyone concerning the window but as the lock upon the sash works very stiffly as you can see it is my opinion that it is not often used as there are plenty of other windows which can more readily be used for such purpose i hardly think it is customary to open this one my daughter has charge of such matters and if you desire it i will send for her to answer the question never mind just now sir said sloane apparently attaching little importance to the matter I may want other information from her, and this can be deferred until later. Sloane went to the window, put his head outside, and examined the roof of the porch, which was but a few inches below. After completing his examination, he withdrew his head and lowered the sash. Upon trying the window fastening, which he found very difficult to move, he smilingly observed to us that a little oil upon it would help it if it was desired to have it in working order. He then made a survey of the yard in the rear, which ran back to the stable and carriage house fronting on the next street and occupying the full width of the premises being situated upon a corner the side street line of the house was continued in a brick wall some seven feet in height in this wall there was a gate opening upon the sidewalk that gate is kept locked i suppose the officer said rather unconcernedly always i think replied mr lindley it has a spring lock the key to which is in the care of the servants by whom the gate is used in passing to and from the house there is a bell pull upon the outside for the use of other persons who may have business at that part of the house anybody live over the stable i see curtains at the windows there yes dan my coachman and his wife what kind of persons are they of a very good kind we think don't we mr hopkins i nodded approvingly and mr lindley continued dan is an irishman who has been with me for a long time in one way and another we formerly had him at the factory among the horses and finding him a most careful driver and a good horseman as well as a very steady honest kind of man i brought him here to replace my coachman whom i found inclined to drink too much at times dan has been with us here for nine or ten years and we are proud of him his wife appears to be a very good sort of a woman she does our laundry work in the house and though she does not come so much in my way as dan i think i may say she is a faithful servant my daughter thinks so and as she comes under her charge she is best able to know about this girl winnie who was meddling with the jewelry in your daughter's room and whom you did not suspect of anything serious how long have you known her mr lindley and what is her record so far as you know it inquired sloane in an off-hand sort of way as he continued looking about the room winnie has lived with us only a short time comparatively a year or so my daughter heard of her through one of her acquaintances who was quite interested in her and her mother i don't know much about it myself but believe there is something about a widowed mother with a good-for-nothing son and a young daughter hard work to get along with the son unwilling to assist in any way but to help dispose of what small means his mother and sister can get hold of this friend of miss lindley is charitably disposed one of the few young ladies of these times who from a sense of duty go out of the usual course to discover worthy objects of sympathy if not charity 
she came across this case and the result was that winnie was installed here in the capacity of seamstress and maid miss lindley took kindly to her at once she has never been used to much work being still young and her father at one time i hear having been fairly well off she is perfectly honest and trustworthy so far as i know i did not exactly like the look of the affair with the earrings but i can as yet place no connection between her actions there and their later disappearance very naturally you cannot sir and i do not say that i can it would be a very boldly planned piece of work which we should hardly look for in one so young and apparently unskilled in crime especially as she would know that your first suspicions would point to her more barefaced crimes have been committed by persons as innocent appearing as your winnie sometimes of themselves but oftener through accomplices i don't want you to think that i expect to find the thief in winnie nor in any one else with her assistance not at all mr lindley we are a long way off from success yet which fact compels us to look into every incident or circumstance in any way connected with the case and follow it up for whatever there is in it winnie's part in the mystery will need some attention it may be only to prove her entire innocence in thought or action but believe me just now it will not pay to drop her entirely excuse me for talking so much but sometimes i can't help it and sloane looked as sober as if he had imparted something of great importance by accident which his succeeding inquiries might either confirm or modify what other servants are there in the house two only mary the cook and jerry her son who acts as a general servant replied mr lindley promptly neither of whom could have had any hand in or knowledge of the crime confidently for what reason sir quietly asked sloane firstly because no amount of diamonds would tempt either of them to betray my confidence in and esteem for them why my dear sir if old mary has been so long in my household as confidential and trusted servant that i could safely leave my purse in her charge while i made a tour in europe giving her the responsibility here in my absence which lasted over a period of two years with full charge of the house and its contents and inmates the latter including my two young children if i ask i could do this with perfect confidence in her loyalty and honesty and find on my return that i had not mistaken her in any way do you think i could ever suspect her of having a hand in the abstraction of these paltry diamonds the old gentleman as he warmed up in defence of his tried and faithful servant soon convinced me as he must also have sloane that any suspicions pointing that way would not hold continuing more quietly he said i have the same confidence in her boy jerry he has grown up from a child in my family and has instilled in his mind that feeling of satisfied dependence so characteristic of the colored race he has been trained by his mother to look upon us as his best friends and without ever testing his honesty i have the same faith in him as i have in mary which you are aware is quite unlimited but my second reason for asserting that they had no part in the theft will probably have more weight with you mr sloane as it is not to be expected that you will share my warm feelings of friendship for them they were both below stairs at the time of the robbery mary in the kitchen and jerry in his place as waiter at the table he was still in the dining room attending to his duties where after discovering the loss i went down to hurry him off with the note summoning mr hopkins as mr lindley anticipated his latter statement seemed to clear both of them of any suspicion in the mind of the officer and after inquiring as to the other occupants of the house and learning that they consisted only of mr lindley his son and daughter mr sloane stood a moment in thought and then said it will be necessary to see some of these people your daughter especially but before doing so i should like to see the safe in which the jewelry was kept during the night it is in the passage here said mr lindley as he stepped out followed by sloane and myself the safe which was of small size stood in a recess off a passageway leading from the main hall to mr lindley's rooms it was used merely as a place of deposit for small articles of value in the way of ornaments and relics not often used or worn and as a receptacle for important documents and papers belonging to mr lindley on reaching it and finding the door closed mr lindley grasped the knob to open it but to his evident surprise found that it was locked my daughter appears to have locked it said he and as you probably wish to see the inside of it i will call her and have her open it for to tell the truth i am unable to do it myself it has a combination lock and kate has full control of it 
I have never bothered myself about it, not even knowing the figures upon which it locks, but depend upon her to obtain for me anything within it which I may want. It is rarely opened, however, even by her. I do not think it will be necessary to open it at all, except to discover that everything is all right inside, as there is no chance of finding the diamonds in there, replied Sloane with a smile. But I should like to know when it was locked, and now, if you choose, you may send for Miss Lindley to enlighten us upon this, as well as some other points. Suppose we go down to the library where she will join us, said Mr. Lindley. One moment, please, returned Sloane, as he quickly passed into Mr. Lindley's room, and stepping to the window over the porch, made a close examination of both sashes in the vicinity of the metal fastening. After raising the sash again, he came toward us with, Now I am ready. We can go down at once. Mr. Lindley, leaving us to proceed alone, went off to summon Kate, and together they reached the library a moment after we had entered. Kate came directly up to me with hands extended and a roguish smile upon her face. Well, Fred, your diamonds are gone, notwithstanding your caution to me about burglars, and that I put them in a safe place overnight at least. As I never dreamed of a visit from them by daylight, I relaxed my vigilance, and the result I suppose to be that you will hold me responsible for the loss of them, as threatened. I am not rich, you know, but I guess Papa will settle for them, and withhold the amount from my allowance until he has repaid the loan. Will you not, Papa? This was said as soberly as if it were meant. Without waiting for his reply, she continued, I am so glad the burglars did not get my earrings with the rest. I put them in my ears before breakfast, and thereby caused myself to be made the subject of Pierre's jokes, but ever since the robbery I have been congratulating myself for wearing them, and were it not wicked, believe me, I should turn the laugh upon Pierre when he comes home and learns of the robbery. But seriously, I am terribly nervous over the affair, and shall almost be tempted to wear all my jewelry hereafter to protect it. You will observe I still wear the earrings. How do they look, Fred? I didn't stop to tell her how becoming they were, nor how bewitching she appeared in looks and manner, as she tossed her head from side to side, and from those dark, snapping eyes, shot glances at me which neither the circumstances of our meeting nor the presence of the officer could restrain, but turned at once to business, and introduced Mr. Sloan as an acquaintance of mine connected with police affairs. Oh, yes, I know. Papa told me of him, and that he desired to question me about some matters regarding the affair. Let us be seated. And in her graceful, girlish way, she motioned toward several easy chairs, as she seated herself upon a sofa. Now I am ready, but as I know so little of this affair which Papa has not already told you, I do not see that I could be of much service to you, sir. This to Mr. Sloan in a cool, dignified way, which it was difficult for me to believe possible with her, who always appeared so frank and unreserved in manner. Apologizing for the necessity for his troubling her at all, Mr. Sloan began politely questioning her in an easy, conversational way. Her responses were quick and to the point. First, Miss Lindley, as to the safe, when you took the jewelry out to carry it into your room, do you remember closing the safe door and locking it? I do not, sir, but as it is always my habit to do so, I think it quite likely that I locked it. It requires no key, you know, a turn or two of the little knob securely fastening it. But why do you ask? Did you find it open? No, miss, but if I had, I should have considered it a quite natural condition under the circumstances. You did not find it open, then, as you might have left it, and closed it upon your father's discovery of the loss. No, sir. Papa told me to have everything upstairs left as it was until your arrival. If the safe door had been open, however, I think I should have noticed it, as I passed close to it, in going downstairs from Papa's room. That will do for the safe at present. But, before I leave, I wish you would open it, just to satisfy us that its contents have been undisturbed. Now, Miss Lindley, what are the duties in the house of the girl, Winnie? She does plain sewing for me, and assists in taking care of the rooms. Is it her duty to open the sleeping room windows in the morning for the purpose of airing the rooms? Yes, sir, and she usually does that, and other necessary chamber work, while we are at breakfast. Did she open them this morning? I have been so excited over the affair of the diamonds that really I have not noticed whether any of the windows are open or not. If she had opened them, you would have found them still open when you arrived, as neither Winnie nor anyone else has been upstairs since our discovery. By your orders? Yes, sir. 
Is it customary with her to open all the windows at this season? Of that I cannot speak positively, although it is my opinion that, with the exception of one window in Papa's room, she is apt to throw them all open. The catch upon that one works so hard that she complained to me of the difficulty of moving it, and I told her that, until it was remedied, she might keep it closed. That is the window alongside the bureau and over the back porch? Yes, sir. From what you know of this girl, have you any reason to doubt her being perfectly honest and trustworthy? Not at all, sir. On the contrary, I have the greatest confidence in her, and would trust her in any way. Does she know that the diamonds are missing? Yes, sir, and so do all the servants, excepting perhaps Dan, the coachman, and his wife. How did they find it out? I told Winnie myself, as I met her in the call immediately after the discovery. Papa told Jerry something about it, when he sent him downtown with the message, I believe, as when I went downstairs a few minutes ago, I found him and his mother discussing it, and they both eagerly asked me for particulars about it. What do you think of Winnie's actions in your room as witnessed by your father? That thinking herself alone, and dazzled by the beauty of the ornaments, as most young girls would have been, she allowed her curiosity, or vanity, if you please, to get the better of her judgment. Nothing more, I assure you. How did she act when you told her of your loss? She was greatly agitated. In fact, she seemed considerably excited before I told her. But, remembering how Papa had caught her unawares, and thinking that she must suspect something wrong from our actions in whispered conferences, I did not wonder at it. Where did she pass the time while you were at breakfast, as for some reason she appears not to have aired the rooms or performed any other usual chamber work this morning? In her room, probably, though why she should have neglected her duties I cannot say. It is something quite unusual for her. Does she ever have visitors here? Occasionally her mother calls to see her, and once in a great while her brother comes here. With these exceptions, she has no company, and she seldom goes out except to visit her mother's. This brother of hers, who you say sometimes comes here, what do you know of him? Nothing, only that he is a lazy, worthless fellow, living upon his mother and sister. Winnie seldom mentions him to me, as she can say no good for him. What brings him here, do you suppose? I fancy that he comes to get money from Winnie, although she has never told me so. She always appears flurried after he has been here, and as she does not apparently relish his visits, I can see no other object in his coming. She seems heartily ashamed of him, and, I think, would give him almost her last penny to keep him away from the house. They were not always poor, and Winnie is proud. I am so sorry for her, and yet she seems quite happy here with us. What is her brother's name? Uh, Richard. Richard Evans. The family is English, I believe, though they came to New York when the children were small. Do you know where they live? Yes, sir, but I cannot give you the address, as I forget the number. I called there once with a friend at the time I engaged Winnie, now nearly two years ago. It is in East Blank Street, not far from 3rd Avenue. It does not matter, Miss Lindley. Sloan here took a small memorandum book from his pocket, and, after making a few hurried entries therein, said as he replaced it and rose from his chair, Now, Miss Lindley, if you will oblige us by accompanying us upstairs, and perhaps answer one or two questions, I will release you from any further trouble on my account at present. No trouble at all, sir, I assure you, replied Kate, smilingly. I'm only too glad to do my part towards solving this mystery, but I'm afraid that I am proving a quite unimportant witness. Of that we cannot yet judge, miss, said Sloane respectfully, without showing in looks or manner whether he had learned anything of value or not. End of section 3「Miss Lieberbach's recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter 6. Arrived upstairs, Mr. Sloan called Kate's attention to the fact that the only window which was open was the one that was supposed to be closed, and, in a quiet way, to the condition of all the rooms, which was just as they had been left by their occupants in the morning. Kate flushed a little at this latter allusion to the untidy appearance of things. "'I don't understand it at all,' she said. 
i never noticed anything about the rooms when i came up with papa in my excitement hastily looking over my bureaus dressing case and closets to see if anything but the diamonds had been taken and you discovered nothing missing everything in the way of jewelry money or valuables of any kind was in its usual place so with my dresses and everything else that i could think of it seemed strange because nothing was locked up and there were many things which could have been taken as easily as the diamonds my jewel case for instance in papa's room i found the same state of affairs excepting that he had disturbed things a little in his search for the missing jewels is it not a singular case mr sloane rather so i admit and fortunate for you that it is i take it responded sloane while mr lindley gave utterance for the first time to any opinion he may have formed by saying that it looked to him as if the theft had been committed by someone who knew of the diamonds being in the house and had gone no further than necessary to secure them only this view of the case had been mine for some time and i think also sloane's for although we had not been told that nothing but the diamonds was taken we must have inferred such to be the case from the fact that the loss of nothing else was mentioned and all investigation so far was on their account this window which is so difficult to open miss how do you manage in washing it oh jerry washes all the windows and he is strong and probably opens it without much difficulty is it often washed as often as necessary i think though not as frequently as those at the front of the house not being so much exposed to dust but really sir i don't wonder at your asking that question for i should judge on closer inspection that a little soap and water would improve it and kate laughed heartily over what she considered mr sloane's joke at her expense while he poor fellow never having intentionally perpetrated a joke in his life apologized in a most bungling way being taken completely off his guard by kate i didn't mean that you know miss lindley i think the glass is remarkably clean and bright at least compared with some that i have seen but i wanted to know whether it had lately been washed in order to fix another circumstance in my mind and sloane began to settle down to business again well really i can't say just when it was cleaned but certainly not within a week or two said kate that roof under the window has been recently painted i see mr lindley about how long since it was done said sloane about a month or so replied mr lindley you have a burglar alarm attached to this window i see yes sir and to all the lower openings of the house and to the stable is it in good working order yes sir i think it is not like most of them then mr lindley as far as my knowledge of them goes they frighten people oftener by false alarms than by truthful announcements of attempted robberies may i see the indicator attached to the alarm certainly sir you will find it in my dressing room there after looking at the machine and its attachments sloane returned into the room saying that alarm has no connection with this case i notice that it has a clock attachment which automatically throws it out of use at six o'clock in the morning of course if the apparatus was in working order this morning it was disconnected several hours before this robbery occurred and consequently any tampering with the doors or windows while you were at breakfast would not be indicated upon it certainly not mr sloane after standing a few moments in thought sloane requested that the boy jerry be summoned mr lindley rang for him and he came in presently looking uneasily around the room and at its occupants mr lindley informed him that the gentleman indicating mr sloane wished to talk with him a little and jerry bowing politely first to his employer and then to sloane waited somewhat nervously for him to begin sloane who had carefully scanned the youth as soon as he entered now scarcely looking toward him and in a very reassuring way said jerry your mistress informs me that you generally wash the windows here now can you tell me when you last washed that one next to the bureau whether it was before or since the roof beneath it was painted i washed it week before last i think it was sir at any rate it was a week or more after the roof was painted because before i went out on it i tried the paint and it was dry and hard said jerry who was recovering himself under mr sloane's gentle manner then when you wash that window on the outside you stand upon the roof yes sir it's handier than sitting on the window sill like i have to with the rest of em i thought that was about it jerry that will do for the window i guess have you seen the coachman this morning yes sir he was in the kitchen a while ago nothing unusual about that i suppose oh no sir he often comes in there 
did he know anything of the diamonds being stolen before you told him of it for i suppose of course you did tell him yes sir i did after he told mother and me something kind of queer about miss winnie's brother ah indeed and sloan began to show more interest what was it so queer about him dan said he saw him come into the yard through the side gate this morning and go down into the basement in a little while he saw winnie almost pushing him down the back steps and he went out of the gate in a hurry and ran down the street like mad so then you thought he might have had something to do with the diamonds and told dan about them did he agree with you i don't know sir but i know he don't like that richard he told me to tell mr lindley what he saw well jerry you can go now said sloan hurriedly dismissing him as soon as he had passed the door, Sloan requested Mr. Lindley to call the coachman at once. I don't know that there's anything in it, but if there is, there is no time to waste in getting at it. These latter remarks to me while Mr. Lindley was hurrying after Dan. Miss Lindley, will you oblige me by joining your seamstress, Winnie, downstairs, and keeping her with you until I may call her, provided I wish to see her? With pleasure, sir, though I have no fear that she will try to run away, replied Kate, with some hauteur, rising and preparing to leave. "'Possibly not, miss,' said Sloane politely. "'But in such matters it is always best to go very cautiously. "'Unless she starts the subject herself, "'I would advise that you do not discuss the robbery with her.' "'Kate, promising compliance, withdrew just as her father entered the room, "'ushering in Dan. "'I knew Dan very well, as I had for years, "'and as intimated by Mr. Lindley in his praises of him to the detective, "'I liked him. "'He was a cool-headed, steady-going Irishman.' somewhere of middle age with a frank open countenance ruddy complexion and a pair of twinkling gray eyes lighting up a face which when i first knew him was positively handsome and was yet far from ugly his hair which was clipped close to his head was sandy in color matching his long english chop whiskers rather under the medium in height and weight he was built like an athlete with good figure deep-chested and square-shouldered in his neat livery when seated upon the box with reins well in hand and whip at proper poise he was a model coachman in looks which his skill in horsemanship and graceful dexterity in driving in no wise belied we were all proud of dan and he was proud of his position and though given to sly humor at times was most respectful on all occasions as he entered the room and mr lindley motioning toward the officer explained the reason for his visit dan appeared just the least bit nervous but soon recovered himself. Jerry has told us, said Sloan, that you saw some person enter the street gate this morning. Did you recognize that person beyond doubt? Sure, sir. I'd never mistake that loafer. Who was it, Dan? Who else, sir, but that fellow they call Richard, the brother of Miss Winnie, the seamstress here in the house. How do you come to know him? Know him? Isn't it meself as had to throw him out of the stable a half dozen times when he has come loafing around there? What was his object in visiting the stable? Divil a bit do I know more nor yourself. He pretended to be wanting to see his sister and would hang around smoking and spitting upon the floor. Once or twice he had some other loafer with him. So as I was not starving for company and had an eye to keep all the whips and things for my own use and the good of the boss here i just made it my business to fire him out i was obliged to do this so often it got to be kind of tiresome like so one day i just hustled him out of it on the lash of a big carriage whip and divil a half of his ugly face have i seen till this morning when he come sneaking in at the gate and went down the kitchen steps what time was that dan well, i can't say exactly but not much off from nine o'clock I always get around to the house with the coupé at nine to take Mr. Pierre downtown, and I had the carriage ready to drive out, and was shutting up the back door of the carriage house when I seen him as I told you. What did you do? Nothing, sir, but just kape my eyes on the house here for a few minutes, when, all of a sudden, the back door of the top of the stoop below was open, and out he come again in a big hurry, and his sister nearly pushing him down the steps out of the gate he went and down the street on a dead run as i could hear by the noise of his feet he looked like he was being chased by a ghost and be jabbers he traveled like he thought it was gaining on him 
Did you mention this to young Mr. Lindley when he came out? Yes, sir. What did he think of it? He said he thought maybe the fellow had a quarrel with his sister and run away because she threatened to call for help, but perhaps I ought to mention it to his father here. You see, sir, they all feel sorry for Miss Winnie on account of this fellow, but don't like to mention him to her. How do you suppose he got in at the gate? It's more nor I know, sir, for it's always locked. He must have had the key. Where is the key of this gate kept? Well, I don't know, sir. It's nothing to me, for I never use it. To Mr. Lindley, will you please find out where the key is kept and whether it can be found? Mr. Lindley went out at once and soon returned with the information that the key was in its usual place alongside the back basement door. I think that this news was disappointing to Sloane, who, I imagined, had sent Mr. Lindley for information with confidence that the key would not be found. However, he did not allow it to disconcert him in the least. There is but one key to this gate, I suppose, sir? Yes, replied Mr. Lindley, so far as I know. The servants in going out always take it, I suppose. They are presumed to, although, of course, they might possibly neglect to do so, in which case they would have to ring the bell at the gate or at the front of the house to be admitted. Or, begging your pardon, sir, interrupted Dan, come to the stable and have me let them through that way, as Miss Winnie did last night. Ah, said Sloane quickly, how was that? Well, I was sitting in the carriage house door, smoking me pipe and enjoying the cool evening air before bedtime, when along come Miss Winnie with her pleasant face, and said she had no key to the gate, and, as it was a little late, she didn't like to ring, so she thought she would go through the carriage house way. I jumped up and opened the door, mighty glad to do her a favor, for she is a lady all over, spite of that lazy spalpeen of a brother. What time was that, Dan? About ten o'clock, sir, for I was just after going to bed, and that is my time every night when I am not out with the horses. That will do, Dan, for the present. Thank you, sir. I wish I could help you some way, sir to catch the thief, and I am sorry now that I did not do it this morning. You did right in letting this Richard go, if he is the person you mean as the thief, as, if we want him, we can easily get him. Well, I hope you may, sir, and you won't go astray neither, said Dan, as he departed, bowing to each of us. It was now past one o'clock, the investigation so far having taken nearly two hours. After consulting his watch, Sloane, turning to Mr. Lindley, said, as it will be necessary to get to work in other directions. If you will now let this Winnie appear, I will get through with her as soon as possible and get back to headquarters. I will say just here that matters look quite encouraging for capturing both the diamonds and the thief, and if this girl's testimony turns out as I anticipate, we shall unravel the whole mystery before night. Of course, both Mr. Lindley and myself knew to whom Sloane was pointing as the thief, and as we had the same grounds as he upon which to base our suspicions, we could not but agree with him in his conclusions. Though, if we drew our inferences wholly from Dan's story, we must believe Winnie to be in league with her brother, for supposing him to have the diamonds with her knowledge, why, if she were innocent and honest, should she help him to escape with them instead of try to detain him? But for one fact, we might have thought that she had discovered him prowling about the house while the family was at breakfast, and, watching him, had seen him steal the diamonds, when pouncing upon him, she had forced him to give them up, and, before he recovered from his fright, had got him out of the house as rapidly and quietly as possible. The one fact which stood against Winnie's loyalty and honesty, as suggested by this view of the case, was that the diamonds were missing. Winnie knew that we were aware of this, and that, with the assistance of an officer of the law, we were investigating the manner of their disappearance. Still, we had no aid from her towards dispelling the mystery, which she could have cleared up at a word. Admitting that the girl might have a natural desire to shield from harm those who were near and dear to her, for myself I must acknowledge that I could discover no reason for her to jeopardize her reputation by shielding this cowardly rascal, brother though he was. Although not a word passed between us, I am satisfied that these were about the thoughts of all three of us at the time Sloane requested Mr. Lindley to produce Winnie, and when she arrived, as she did shortly, the case against her looked bad enough. End of section 4《Section Five of A Flurry in Diamonds by Amos Chiptree. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. 
Chapter 7 Of all the people connected with the household, I knew personally least of Winnie. I had, in my visits there, caught occasional glimpses of her, and had noticed that she was passably good-looking, of good height and figure, fair complexion, bluish-gray eyes, and light brown wavy hair, that she appeared neatly, though plainly dressed, and seemed quite diffident and reserved in manner, giving me the impression that, for some cause, she wished to escape the critical observation of visitors. Knowing her history, I had attributed this shyness to a sort of discontent with her position in the house. I may have been wrong in this conclusion, but I had Kate's authority for it, that she was proud-spirited, and therefore thought that, like other people of spirit, when suddenly driven by adversity from a life of comparative ease into a position of dependence, she inwardly chafed under her enforced servitude. As she came in now, at first glancing hurriedly at Sloane and myself, then allowed her eyes to drop in a slightly confused manner, just as might be expected of an entirely innocent person, under like circumstances, it was plain that she had nerved herself for the interview, and, excepting that she was very pale, there was nothing in her looks or manner indicating that unusual excitement which the events of the day must naturally have produced in one of her temperament. Mr. Lindley, indicating Sloane by a wave of his hand, told her that the gentleman wished to ask her a few questions, to which her only reply was a graceful bowing of her head to her employer and a quiet glance at Sloane. Mr. Lindley and I withdrew a little way, and all remained standing during the interview. Sloane began by saying, of course you know, miss, what has brought me here, and likewise know that it is necessary for me, in trying to discover how and by whom the robbery was committed, to carefully examine every incident which may seem to have any bearing upon the case. An approving nod from Winnie. There are certain circumstances which seem to be capable of explanation by you alone, as you seem to have been the only person of the household who was upstairs at the time the jewels were taken. Another nod from Winnie who, up to this time, had not spoken a word, but stood looking fixedly at Sloane. He at once commenced his inquiries in an off-hand way, and, as he proceeded, frequently changed his position, sometimes walking up and down, his hands in his pockets and his eyes wandering about the room, occasionally, as he rapidly put a question, stopping short and looking the girl squarely in the face. Winnie, on her part, treated him most respectfully, answering his questions generally with promptness and in a clear though very low voice he first asked her about the disordered state of the rooms which she explained by saying that her mortification at being discovered by mr lindley trying on the earrings and his apparent displeasure toward her as shown by his actions had quite unnerved her and she had at once left the rooms which she had entered to attend to her usual duties there some time after as she was on her way to tidy up the rooms she met miss lindley who, after telling her of the robbery, had instructed her to go downstairs, leaving everything upstairs undisturbed. About the window over the porch, nothing was elicited beyond a confirmation of Miss Lindley's statement that she, Winnie, had complained of the difficulty in opening it, and that Miss Lindley had told her to omit doing so until it was repaired, since which time she had never disturbed it. Were you surprised when you first came into the rooms this morning of seeing the diamonds upon the dressing table? Not at all, sir. Miss Lindley commonly allows her jewelry to be exposed in that manner. But so large a number of valuable earrings must naturally, I should think, have caused you some surprise. It might, under ordinary circumstances, have done so, sir, as the display was quite unusual. But knowing the conditions under which the diamonds were in the house, I saw nothing unnatural about it. Miss Lindley told you of them last night, then? Yes, sir. As I came in to ask her permission to run over home a while, I found her examining them, and she told me about Mr. Hopkins having brought them at her father's request for her to make a selection from. She showed me the pair she had chosen and asked my opinion upon her choice. You then went out into your mother's? About what time was this? I don't know exactly, but somewhere between eight and nine. Did you take the key of the gate with you, as I hear it is customary for you to do? Winnie showed a little hesitancy in answering this question, but finally said, Yes, sir. Where did you say your mother lives? I did not say, but she lives at number blank East Blank Street. Ah, not a long walk. She lives there alone with your brother, I believe? Yes, sir. Anybody there besides them when you were there last night? 
No, sir. I suppose you told your mother and brother about Miss Lindley's birthday gift? I did mention it to my mother, but as my brother was asleep upon a lounge pretty much all the time I was in the house, I cannot say whether or not he heard what I said. At any rate, I don't remember that he showed any interest in it. When you came back here, you came in by the gate as usual, I suppose. Here, Sloane, who had been walking back and forth with his head lowered and his eyes cast down almost in a line with his feet, suddenly stopped in front of Winnie, looking straight into her eyes. If she had not before suspected that Sloane was questioning her for some other purpose than merely, as he had told her, to have her explain certain points which might appear to bear upon the case, this question must have convinced her that she was under suspicion. As a matter of fact, I believed from the first that she had anticipated this, and was consequently in better form to meet his wily questions. Besides, she must have known that Dan had been put through a course of questions, and would naturally conclude that he had told all that he knew. At all events, beyond a momentary start as Sloane so suddenly stopped in front of her, she showed no especial agitation. No, sir for when I arrived at the gate I found that I had lost the key. Then I went around to the stable, and Dan, the coachman, let me through into the yard, as I presume he told you, added Winnie with a rather scornful look at the officer. How do you account for the loss of the key? Where did you place it on going out? In the pocket of my sack, but as the evening was warm, I removed the sack when I reached my mother's. It must have dropped from the pocket as I took it off, or in putting it on again before leaving. You are sure of this, and have not seen it since? Yes, sir, I have. Indeed. When and where? My brother brought it around this morning, and gave it to me, and I hung it up in its proper place beside the basement door. He used it, I suppose, in entering the gate? I presume so, sir. These responses I could plainly see were somewhat disappointing to Sloane, as I freely acknowledged they were to myself. If Winnie were telling the truth, and the whole truth, the case against her was weakening, while if she were lying, it was evident that she had had plenty of time to prepare for herself plausible explanations of all the compromising circumstances of which she suspected us to be aware. This brother, does he often visit you? Not very, but quite as often as he is welcome. Not much love between you, I think, miss? No, sir. Although, if Richard would behave himself as he should, God knows I would only be too glad to regard him more as a brother and less as a trouble to mother and me. Only this morning, making an excuse to come here about the key, he came up to my room, and I was obliged to give him money in order to prevent his making a disturbance here. I finally had almost to push him out of the house while threatening to call Mr. Lindley. This had its effect, and he scampered away. Thus, Winnie had, in her way, explained Dan's story voluntarily, instead of putting Sloane to the trouble of drawing it out piecemeal. She remained perfectly cool and self-possessed. If she were acting a part, she was doing it without a fault. After one or two unimportant questions asked in a very respectful manner, and which I thought he improvised in order to regain her confidence, Sloane politely informed her that he could think of nothing further just then which he desired to ask her. It will be necessary, however, he said, to look over your room, as well as those of the servants, more as a matter of form, perhaps, than with any idea of discovering the lost property. My duty, miss, requires this, as well as many other proceedings on my part, which are anything but agreeable. You are perfectly welcome, sir, to any assistance I can give you in any way, replied Winnie blandly, and Sloane, turning to Mr. Lindley, suggested making the search immediately. Accompanied by Winnie, they started, while I went downstairs to await the result. I found Kate in the library, and she appeared pleased at my coming. I could see that, although she was trying to make light of the affair of the diamonds, she was considerably cut up over it, first because she was directly, though innocently, the cause of the loss, and further because she must know that Winnie was suspected of complicity in the theft. Kate prided herself upon her household management, and for one so young she certainly did possess unusual abilities in that line. After her mother's death, for several years the house had been managed by a thoroughgoing, practical housekeeper whom Mr. Lindley had directed to instruct Kate as she grew up in the science and mysteries of household economy. Kate took readily to the task, and under her very competent teacher, with an inborn aptitude for it, 
had progressed so well that at sixteen she had assumed control of domestic affairs including the selection of servants she had experienced considerable difficulty in the latter connection except in the kitchen and dining room where mary and her son were permanent fixtures and had decided at the time she took on winnie to do without any regular chambermaid dividing the duties in that way and what plain sewing was done in the house between herself and winnie she told her father when he remonstrated with her that there was hardly enough work about it to furnish her with necessary exercise and besides it would make the situation easier for winnie to whom she seemed to take a liking on first acquaintance as she was accustomed to having her way in such matters and as he could see no real objection to the arrangement mr lindley made no further opposition as shown by her statement to sloane kate had unlimited confidence in winnie in fact had made almost a companion of her and i was sure that it would require strong proofs to induce kate to lessen her belief in her faithfulness it was not for me to undertake the task in any event and as i was not as confident myself that we were upon the right track as i had been previous to sloane's examination of the girl i responded to kate's anxious inquiries as to the result of our interview with winnie with evasive answers i told her that the affair was somewhat mysterious as yet but that winnie was not clear of suspicion acknowledged that she had made a pretty good case in her own defense but as there was no proof as yet available as to the truth of her statements of course we had only her word to rely upon and a good reliance it is fred at least i have always found it to be so no doubt you have kate and that you should believe in her truthfulness under present circumstances is excusable perhaps as it is certainly meritorious on your part for myself i have no positive opinion to express from any point of view the affair to me is as mysterious as ever but excuse me i hear sloane and your father coming perhaps they may have something new well mr hopkins said sloane as he came in we have made no discoveries and as the diamonds are evidently not in the house here unless they are locked in the safe upstairs which it seems only miss lindley can open i must hurry around to headquarters and start things working from there will you go with me sir as without losing any more time i desire to talk with you a little not to leave anything undone here however i should be pleased to have you go up miss lindley and look the safe over before we go we will await your return here wouldn't it be too funny if the diamonds should be there laughed kate as she started to leave more serious than funny i should say as it might involve the necessity of confining someone in an insane asylum until she should recover her wits retorted mr lindley rather petulantly the affair was evidently beginning to disturb his usual good temper of course nothing came of the search in the safe kate reporting everything there as she had left it in the morning and i signified to sloane my readiness to accompany him as proposed mr lindley cautioned the latter to keep matters as quiet as possible as he did not fancy the notoriety which a publication of the affair would create sloane promised to let them know immediately if any further developments were made and it was agreed that we should both return to the house for further conference at nine o'clock in the evening pierre would then be at home and his views on the case might possibly be of service to us mr lindley was going downtown immediately after lunch on business of his own and would be at pierre's office where he would explain matters to him End of section five section six of a flurry in diamonds by amos chiptree this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tom penn chapter eight sloan did not talk much on the way down in the cars but upon our arriving at headquarters after a short interview with his chief he invited me into a private room and we went over the case together i found pretty soon that despite winnie's plausible story and her calm collected manner during her examination sloan firmly believed in her guilt that she was either implicated with her brother in the theft or that knowing him to have stolen the diamonds she assisted in his escape from the house with the booty there is no other construction to be put upon her actions of course she makes up a good story to tell us knowing where our suspicions lie and knowing also just what has led us to have such suspicions i don't think that she knew about dan having seen her brother enter the house by the gate and her hurrying him out by the back door but she didn't dare take any chances on that after i caught her a little off guard about losing the key and coming in by the stable she surmised that dan had told all he knew and she was not quite sure how much that might be 
so she rattled off the latter part of her story without interruptions by me and made things fit together very nicely it was well done i admit but she had time enough to prepare herself and i am not much surprised at the result she is a keen one but i have assisted in bringing just as sharp ones as she is to grief and with less show than i have in her case i could see much good reasoning in sloane's views but yet remembering winnie's previous good record could hardly bring myself to believe her as artful deceitful and wicked as his language implied her to be and told him so i am not surprised mr hopkins in fact should be more surprised if with your supposed knowledge of the girl you should be easily convinced of her guilt in my capacity as a detective i must drop any fine feelings of sentiment if i ever have any and study circumstances in people from a matter-of-fact point of view my calling sir is not one calculated for charitable kindly disposed sort of people to follow as the truth of this remark was so self-evident it required no comments from me now let me explain some of the other incidents in this case which may help to convince you that i am not so far off the track after all my first impression as to the robbery was that it had been committed by a professional burglar as i did not attach any importance to mr lindley's discovery of the girl trying on the earrings but later discoveries drove that idea out of my mind and convinced me that the diamonds were taken by or with the assistance of someone living in the house no professional thief would ever have unlocked that bureau drawer and after taking the jewels have so carefully relocked it nor would he have limited his booty to the diamonds alone when there were so many other valuables within reach how should he have known that the diamonds were in that drawer even if he knew they were in the house there was only one solution to the question which to my mind gave any sort of color to the professional theory the thief might have entered the house by some means before the family had gone downstairs and remaining in concealment have seen the diamonds secreted by mr lindley but if so he must have entered the house between six and say eight o'clock as mr lindley tells me it was somewhere about eight o'clock when he went down to breakfast as the burglar alarm seems to be in working order it would have indicated any attempted entrance before six o'clock at which time it would cease to work as the servants were by that hour moving around the lower part of the house while some of the people upstairs might reasonably be supposed to be awake if not already up in fact both mr lindley and his son were up as he tells me a thief entering at such a time would have to take more chances of detection than such people like to risk then there remains the evidence of the open window in mr lindley's room that is the strongest link in the case against the girl and shows the cool deliberate manner in which she performed her part of the robbery and tried to throw us off the scent how is that mr sloane i inquired eagerly for i had kept that window in mind as indicating the means by which the thief had gained entrance and it was really a strong point with me in winnie's favor that window was opened by the thief mr hopkins but it was done from the inside and not as you imagine and i at first thought as a means of entering or leaving the house but to give us a false clue the colored boy jerry and the paint on the roof of the porch helped me out of that in what way i asked getting very much interested the new paint don't show a scratch excepting close to the house where the boy stood upon it while washing the window no person could clamber over the edge of that roof going either up or down without leaving some marks or scratches upon the paint in addition to this there are no marks showing that the metal fastening had been tampered with and you can believe from the stiff working of it that it would take considerable force to move it by operating with a knife blade between the sashes that is the plan generally adopted by thieves when they do not remove any glass and the evidence of it is always plainly seen upon the woodwork or the fastening itself yes sir the girl or her brother opened that window it was a pretty cunning piece of work as far as it went but like many cases which i have come across where studied attempts to mislead pursuit have been employed it has only served to furnish additional evidence against the culprit how do you explain the locking of the bureau drawer i inquired not at all unless that it was an accident he replied at once you see sir the locks upon ordinary articles of furniture are usually very plain and simple and it is quite a common thing to find a key which will open many of them sometimes a single key answers for a whole chest of drawers yet with mr lindley's bureau you found that not to be the case i said true and i tried that key to make sure the trouble with it was that it belonged to a finer lock than that which the thief opened and as you saw it would not even enter the common lock 
if mr lindley had locked the diamonds in the drawer from which i took the key it is my opinion that they would still have been there when he came to look for them either the girl or her brother had some ordinary drawer key which fitted the lock and opened it without much trouble in withdrawing the key after securing the booty the drawer may have been accidentally locked well sloane you appear to make a pretty clear case against these people i must confess i said after a moment as he seemed to have finished now how are you going to proceed first i want to see this likely brother and if things turn out as i hope he should be here soon the chief has sent a couple of men around to arrest him if he is at home and to search his mother's rooms for the jewelry do you think that after so long a time has elapsed since the theft either will be found there as to the man yes but as to the diamonds no this fellow richard evans they call him is not a known thief he is probably only a lazy loaferish kind of chap who won't work for a living as long as his mother and sister will keep him in a home and furnish a moderate supply of pocket money for him to spend in beer and tobacco among others of his kind such a life naturally leads on to something worse and then we have more interest here in keeping track of the gang he comes of a little better stock than most of his fellows and consequently aims a little higher in his ambition to steal than do the others with whom tiltapping and sneak thieving in a small way will serve as a beginning then you acknowledge a sort of aristocracy even among thieves i said considerably amused at sloane's way of putting it i am obliged to he replied why a first-class cracksman will no more mix with a pickpocket or a successful forger or counterfeiter with a common thief than will one of our crooked aldermen or indiscreet bank presidents or cashiers with criminals of a lower grade than themselves whom they may meet behind prison bars or enjoying the freedom of canada this richard like his sister is poor and probably proud he heard her describe the diamonds to his mother or perhaps to himself and either of himself or with her connivance planned to get them the gate key may have been accidentally dropped upon the floor or it may have been purposely placed in his possession at all events barring a slip or two their plans worked all right and richard aided by his sister got the diamonds or he may have planned it out alone after finding the key and getting into the house ran across his sister and being opposed by her may have threatened her in some way and thus by frightening her have obtained if not her assistance at least her promise of secrecy this latter is the most charitable view i can take of the girl and even at that she must either have shown him where the diamonds were secreted or have opened the drawer herself under threats from him during my whole questioning of her though she showed no outward signs of excitement or emotion as even innocent persons sometimes will in a similar position yet i could see that beneath the surface there was something held back which her very plausible story did not account for she knows i do not believe in her and you will find out mr hopkins when this case is cleared up that i am right and that she has not told everything she knows about it it looks that way sloane i replied but unless you find the diamonds upon one or the other of them i doubt if you will ever convince miss lindley of winnie's guilt by the way you have said nothing as to your views upon the disposition of the diamonds and as i am more interested in them than i am in the capture of the thief i am anxious to know what prospect we have of securing them our people here are now hunting the pawn shops and purchases of that kind of goods and will probably come across them somewhere or at least get information of them and before long richard undoubtedly has disposed of some if not all of them before this and it being his first great offence he will be afraid of his shadow for a while why do you think your men will find him at home because he has had time enough to sell or pledge the diamonds and will want to get somewhere to conceal the money obtained for them he is new to the business and probably not acquainted around the usual hiding places of thieves and he will likely hide himself and the money about home for a while it is time we heard from there sloane had hardly finished speaking when in answer to a tap upon the door he jumped up and partially opening it had a short conference with some person outside closing the door again he turned toward me with a self-satisfied look and said well sir we have got him and he will be here in a moment and surely enough the door presently opened again and the superintendent came in accompanying a young fellow who though a stranger to me i could readily believe was winnie's brother he looked to be about twenty years old was rather undersized in height but of solid blocky build his light hair was cut short and his upper lip was only part concealed by a weak apology for a moustache of somewhat sandy hue 
he had eyes of similar color and natural expression to those of his sister and there was something in the general cast of his features which one could easily construe into a resemblance to her but beyond this look of family connection there was no similarity of either appearance or manner between them his irregular dissipated habits were already telling upon him in his eyes which were heavy-looking and dull in his face which showed the smooth shiny puffy appearance so common among beer drinkers in his uneasy nervous manner causing him to be fidgety with his hands and legs and to keep his jaws constantly in motion upon a quid of tobacco in his mouth notwithstanding an air of bravado which he was trying to assume he had a scared look about him and showed i thought that he felt himself in a bad fix he was examined at length by the superintendent and sloan in my presence and to my surprise notwithstanding his apparent discomfort and uneasiness under their masterly questioning and cross-questioning and while he attempts to draw something additional out of him he repeated winnie's statements concerning his visit to the house in every detail he hesitated often over the questions and tried to shirk some of them this was especially the case with questions pertaining to his forcing money from his sister and to her threatening to call upon mr lindley to eject him at this point he volunteered the statement that he had gone directly home from mr lindley's and had remained there until his arrest he appeared to gain confidence in himself as he proceeded and when the officers had finished with him i could see an air of triumph about him which i thought boded no good to him i feared that it would magnify his ideas of his own cleverness in this his first experience with the police his examination over he was taken out of the room by the two officers at his request i remained until sloan returned which he did after considerable delay i soon learned from him that nothing had been found either upon the prisoner or at his home which implicated him in the theft but that they were going to hold him at headquarters quietly pending further developments no reports had yet been received from the officers sent out among the pawn shops and dealers but it was hardly time to expect them yet i judged by sloane's humor that he was disappointed at the result of the interview with richard he appeared indisposed to talk much and i got the foregoing information in brief replies to my questions finally i asked him bluntly whether or not richard's statements had changed his views of the case any to which he answered rather pettishly no sir not in the least but if we had arrested the girl first and kept her out of the way we might have saved ourselves some trouble why i asked what has she done done why as soon as we left the house she hurried right over to her mother's saw her brother and fixed up his story for him he answered vexatiously how do you know that i asked why as our men got to the house they saw her hurrying away at least they saw a woman leave the house whose description tallies with the girls besides they had nearly got the old lady to acknowledge that she had been there before the son cautioned her to keep still which he did at once when he saw what they were driving at i suspected when the fellow first began to answer our questions that he had been posted in his sister's story of course it is too late now to remedy the matter but if i had suspected that she would be up to any such games i should have instructed the men to arrest her if they found her in the neighborhood her visit may also account for our failure to find either the diamonds or the money there added sloane how i inquired by her having taken charge of them herself and carried them away with her you remember richard said that he went straight away home this morning after being hustled out of the house by his sister and had not left there again previous to his arrest though i placed no weight upon his statement at the time i now believe that part of his story to be true and that in place of his disposing of the diamonds outside he still had them when his sister came round to caution him against us and that the diamonds went back to mr lindley's house with her sloane made this announcement very earnestly and in a somewhat excited manner emphasized his thorough reliance upon this new aspect of the case not fully comprehending the drift of his deductions and somewhat taken aback by the sudden change in his views i said but how do you account for such action on winnie's part supposing you to be right in your suspicion in either one of two ways he replied resuming his usual coolness and self-possession the girl having no reason to fear a further search of the house thinks quite naturally that they can be safely secreted there until the excitement over the theft having subsided they can be otherwise disposed of this is one way of accounting for her running so much risk in transferring them to her own keeping the other way of explaining it and the one in which just now i fully believe is this that winnie seeing her danger and that of her brother has also seen the folly of longer concealing the diamonds and having secured them from her brother by exaggerating his danger will return them to miss lindley if she has not already done so 
with some sort of explanation part true and part false as to how she came to recover them in doing this she must criminate her brother but she will do her best for him and the result will be that miss lindley will believe all she tells her show great pity for her in having such a scapegoat of a brother and shedding tears in sympathy with winnie's at the disgrace she pretends to feel over the affair will end it all by going to her father with the diamonds and convincing him of winnie's faithfulness beg him as a favor to herself not to push the case against richard mr lindley seeing that the diamonds are restored and to avoid any publicity of the scandal for winnie's sake is prevailed upon to give his assent and everybody is happy it is not the first instance of the kind which has come into my experience though not the most agreeable ending to be desired it is one which is not in my power to prevent as sloane proceeded he grew warm and decided and i saw that he was confident of the correctness of his opinion which certainly did seem to be based upon evidences suggesting its soundness without expressing either approval of or dissent from his views i said i suppose then you have nothing to do but to return at once to mr lindley's for a verification of one or the other of your theories either of which should result in the recovery of the diamonds to make it hold good that would at first seem the proper course to follow but a little reflection will show you as it does me that it is better for me to stay away from there until the appointed time this evening if the girl is concealing the jewels which she would only risk doing in the belief that her visit to her mother was not known to me they will be safe for some time to come if as i believe she has restored them why of course my services will be no longer required i shall keep my appointment and if my prediction as to the surrender of the jewels should not be verified it will be time enough then to make another search for them if such search is necessary i will bet a big apple that it will result in my finding the diamonds in either case you see i consider the affair as good as settled we shall hold the fellow richard pending the result as we don't propose having any more conferences between him and his sister though for myself i don't think there would be any danger of that even if he were at liberty still it is best to keep on the safe side any little slip just now might cause us much trouble looking at my watch i discovered that if i were to meet my mother at the store as i had promised father i should do it would be necessary for me to be off at once rising to go i congratulated sloane upon his hopeful view of the case but added laughingly that i should feel better satisfied on my own part when i got possession of the diamonds well mr hopkins he said as he shook my hand i am not much given to boasting of my abilities nor of my powers as a prophet but i tell you candidly that i should be willing for five dollars to guarantee the truth of my prediction that at our meeting tonight at mr lindley's the mystery of the diamonds will be solved in one of the two ways i have mentioned i hope so sir and can assure you that if it so turns out you will be amply rewarded for your services good-bye then till tonight end of section six Section 7 of A Flurry in Diamonds by Amos Chiptree. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter 9. I hurried around to the store and found my mother awaiting my arrival rather anxiously, as it lacked but a half hour of the time for the steamer to leave. Father, having left the store some time before to attend to some little purchases for their comfort on the trip, had left her there for me to escort to the boat where he would meet us i sent one of the clerks out to find a carriage which took some time and by the time we started we had only about fifteen minutes in which to drive to the pier nearly a mile away through the streets crowded at that time of day with vehicles of every description good-natured bantering of the driver as to the qualities of his horses in the promise of an extra fee for prompt driving resulted in our reaching the boat just as the gangplank was about to be hauled off father was standing on the deck at the passageway looking considerably worried and I had only time to pass Mother over to his charge, bid them both good-bye, and wish them a pleasant journey, as I was warned off the boat, reaching the dock just as the plank began to move and the lines were cast off. Returning to the store, I looked over what letters had arrived in my absence, properly disposing of such as Father had left for me to attend to, glanced over the sales of the day, and at whatever new stock had arrived from the factory in fact busied myself in a general way over the various details of business requiring my attention nothing of any special importance appeared to have occurred during my absence excepting that our head salesman mr watson had stopped in for any further instructions which i might have for him before leaving upon his regular trip to boston and other eastern cities 
and for which his stock of jewelry had previously been selected and packed i was a little sorry at first that i had not arrived before he left as i had in mind some special patterns which i wished to add to his assortment but when i happened to remember that a considerable part of those goods was included in the lot which had so mysteriously disappeared up at the lindley's i concluded that it was perhaps as well after all that he had gone if i should recover the diamonds that evening as sloane predicted i could send them after him by express without much loss of time i intended to have told father all about the robbery but as i had no opportunity of doing so concluded that it was just as well that he should not know of it then as it would in some degree interfere with the pleasure of his trip i knew that the house would lose nothing even if the jewelry were not found as from my knowledge of mr lindley i was certain that if the diamonds were not forthcoming within a reasonable time he would insist upon paying us the full value of them legally perhaps he was not responsible to us but i knew that in considering the circumstances connected with the theft of them he would feel in honor bound to make good our loss even though the diamonds were left at his house voluntarily by me and partly to relieve myself of their care no person at the store was aware of the loss nor for that matter of my having taken them away with me no entry had been made of them excepting that i had made a memorandum of them by their marks and numbers in a private book of my own i said nothing to anybody about them and though i felt considerable anxiety over the matter concealed my feelings as well as possible so that i am sure none of the clerks suspected anything as having gone wrong i felt relieved when in an hour or so after my return from the boat and the day's business being concluded i set off on my way uptown i had eaten nothing since breakfast and now that the day's excitement was over was feeling the effect of my long fast in a famishing appetite i stopped in at a restaurant and ate a hearty meal washing it down with a small bottle of chateau margaux after which considerably refreshed in mind and body i proceeded to my quarters at the hotel where i passed an hour or so in quietly smoking and ruminating over the incidents of the day my faith in sloane was strong and he seemed to have worked out a very ingenious solution to the mystery but despite all that i found myself somehow lacking the full confidence in his theory which he himself appeared to have i could find no weak points in it it appeared to cover all the plain facts as well as the more mysterious and contradictory incidents and circumstances of the day but still i could not attribute kate's faith in winnie through thick and thin to a girlish sentimentality such as sloane had indicated i knew kate too well for that the responsibilities which she had assumed in her girl life had made a woman of her at an early age of a lively cheerful disposition naturally she had taken her cares lightly enough but yet she had a matronly way about her in the business affairs of the household which one would scarcely look for in one of her years in disposition that she had been associated for nearly two years with winnie without learning something of her nature i did not believe nor could i agree with sloane with all his experience that kate did not have good grounds for her trust in the girl kate had seen considerable of society and not a little of the world in numerous summer tours about the watering places accompanied by her father and pierre was quite a student of human nature and could see the weak side of an individual as quickly as any person i ever knew yet if sloane's deductions in the case in its present aspects were correct kate's confidence had all along been most sadly misplaced while she had allowed her sympathies to overcome her better judgment i could believe it possible for winnie in a fit of envy contrasting the wide difference in position between her fortunate young mistress and herself to have been suddenly blinded by the glare of the diamonds and perhaps to have stolen them without much thought of the consequences which might follow such action but that she should have connived with her brother for whom she had neither sympathy nor affection in thus robbing her best friends denoted a state of depravity and wickedness in the girl which it seemed to me she could not for so long a time have concealed from kate but further speculation upon the case seemed useless as i should soon know the result of sloane's predictions chapter ten at the appointed time i appeared at mr lindley's and being admitted by jerry was scarcely within the hall when kate coming from the parlor hurriedly came toward me with her finger on her lips and whispering to me that there were some callers in the parlor requested me to go into the library and wait for her as she had something of importance to tell me she would not be long detained by her friends she thought as they had already been there some time she seemed flurried and excited more so than i had ever before seen her i thought although 
As she turned to go back to her callers, she appeared to restrain her feelings. I went into the library, picked up an evening paper, and, seating myself, began looking it over. I could not get interested in the news, however, as Kate's words and manner had so impressed me that I could not concentrate my thoughts upon anything else, but kept turning and folding the sheet, glancing here and there through its columns in continual expectancy of her coming. I was inwardly amused at Kate's mysterious secrecy, and enjoyed in advance her discomfiture when she should learn that her startling developments were not at all unexpected by me. Sloane's predictions, then, must have been verified in when he had restored the stolen diamonds. For the details of the story, I should have to await Kate's coming. It seemed to me her callers would never leave. I wondered what a special subject of gossip or fashion in dress could so interest them, when presently I heard their voices in the hall as they departed, and Kate, in a moment, came in looking relieved. "'Has Sloane arrived yet?' I asked her as I arose to meet her. "'Yes,' she replied. He just now came in and is upstairs with Papa. Shall I go up, or will they come down here? I inquired. Hesitating a moment, she answered me, You would better remain here, as I have something to talk about with you. As you may wish to see Mr. Sloan before he leaves, I will give orders to that effect, if you desire it. Not understanding just what this remark implied, I said, I expected to meet him here this evening, as you know, and certainly shall disappoint myself and him if I fail to do so. All right. I will see that neither is disappointed, she replied as she left the room. Returning in a few moments, now visibly excited, she came toward me with her hand in her dress pocket. As she withdrew her hand, I saw that it contained a photographic card which she handed to me face downward, as she said with considerable emotion, Fred, please read what is written on the back of that card, and then tell me what you think of it. Taking it from her, I quickly read what follows, written with pencil in a hurried manner, but unmistakably in Pierre's hand. Kate, as neither you nor father appear to be proper custodians of the diamonds, I have taken charge of them, to prevent them falling into the hands of some less worthy person. You will probably never see them again, but, as you had your pick out of them last night, you will not miss them. If Fred calls before you see or hear further from me, you may show him this. Perhaps he will understand it better than you or father. Pierre. Where's Pierre? I inquired mildly, endeavoring to suppress the look of surprise which I felt my face must show. Upstairs with your father and the officers? As I collected myself, the idea had struck me that this was a joke of Pierre's, which he had already explained to his father and sister, and of which he was now giving Sloane the particulars. Oh, Fred, how I wish he were, she replied quiveringly. Neither Papa nor I know any more where he is than do you only that we know that he has gone away somewhere. Here she could no longer restrain herself, and her voice was broken with sobs, while her eyes filled with tears as she looked up into my face appealingly and added, But perhaps you can tell us something of him. Is it not possible that you may have met him somewhere, or that he may have sent you some word which will explain his very strange actions? I was not yet in any state of mind to try to quiet or reassure her, as my own excitement had grown as she proceeded, until, as she closed by appealing to me for comfort, I was just beginning to feel the full force of the shock to my nerves which her words had produced. Hesitating for some time, in order to recover myself, finally, without answering her questions, I inquired, Where and when did you get this message? With an effort, she calmed herself sufficiently to reply, It is quite a long story, Fred. Let's sit down. I have been in such a turmoil of excitement and anxiety throughout the day that I begin to think from my feelings that, like other people, I must have nerves, a fact which has never been made so apparent to me before. But, excuse me, I think I hear your friend Sloane coming downstairs. I will send him in here and wait elsewhere for his departure before continuing my story. As she rose to go, brushing the moisture from her eyes with her handkerchief, I asked her if Sloane knew anything of Pierre's message, to which she replied, Nothing whatever nor of anything associated with it. Papa and I concluded to keep him in ignorance of it. But he is here. Make your interview with him as short as possible. I am so impatient that I can hardly wait for him to go. Sloane stepped quickly in, and, walking up to me, grasped my hand warmly. He declined a seat, saying that he had no occasion to tarry, only stopped as he heard I wished to see him. He had nothing new to report except that he had been paid off and dismissed, at which he appeared to show no surprise, 
but rather seemed pleased. It is not my business, you know, sir, to question the motives of people who employ me. The least said about that, the better. You know what I predicted this afternoon as the result of my investigation of this robbery. A part of that prediction was that the girl, finding the pursuit getting too warm for her, would surrender the diamonds and that my services would be no longer required. The latter part of my prophecy having been fulfilled, you can judge as well as I as to the correctness of the balance of it. At any rate, I have nothing more to do with the case except to return to headquarters and have that fellow Richard discharged, as there is no one to appear against him. I congratulate you upon the recovery of your diamonds, which, for all I know, you may already have received. If not, you probably will, as soon as I am out of the way. I tried hard to smile as I answered, I have not yet seen them, but hope, as you say, that I soon may. I thank you heartily, Sloan, for your industry in this case, and shall remember you in any future business which I may have in your line. Thank you, sir, and good night. Kate came in immediately and seemed quite herself again as she seated herself beside me upon a lounge at the back of the room and at once began her story, which, as nearly as possible, I give in her own words, omitting any of the interruptions to which I subjected her at the time, in the way of comments and questions suggested by the various incidents of the recital. End of section 7